Hello, I'm Cheryl Willis Hudson. And I'm Wade Hudson. Welcome to another segment of Just Us And. Today, we are so excited to be chatting with our good friend and award-winning author, Rita Williams Garcia. Rita Williams Garcia is an award-winning and best-selling author of books for young people. She writes YA and middle grade and picture books. Her books, One Crazy Summer, P.S., B11, and Gone Crazy in Alabama, each won Coretta Scott King Awards. She also received a 2011 Newbery Honor, the Scott O'Dell Historical Award for Fiction, and the Penn Norma Klein Award. Rita is the author of Clayton Bird Goes Underground and also other picture books for younger readers. Rita, thanks for joining us. Hey, Rita, how are you? Rita. Good to see you. Well, thank you so much for inviting me. I have been um, following this series, so I'm very glad to be here. And we're glad to have you. Uh, Rita, can you share with uh, our viewers, when did you discover that you had the gift for writing? And once you discovered it, how did you nurture that gift? Well, I always loved story. Um, thanks to my sister, she was always sliding her picture books in my a wooden playpen when I was like a year old. So I knew about turning the page and having that anticipation and in my mind telling myself the story. But um, I got my writer's bump on my right hand very early. I was writing all the time. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, during, um, during kindergarten when they had like, uh, when they had um, color time and all that, um, I would always ask, can I have a pencil and some paper? <laughs> you know, I had to write a story. But um, so I think um, seeing books in print made me say, I can do that. I have stories. And I just started writing. And so uh, by the time I was uh, 12, I was like going to the library and checking out books on being a writer. Mm. So I learned how to uh, prepare a manuscript, how to uh, send a self-addressed stamped envelope to the publisher, um, and um, all, all, the, all the rules. Um, I also learned how much money you could make, which was really <laughs> important to me, because I was out to A, buy some clothes and get a typewriter instead of having to borrow my sister's typewriter. I was tired of that tyranny. Anyway, so... Um, so the first story that uh, um, that I was writing, the first like really long um, story, was a um, autobiography of my elementary school years at Highly, Highland Elementary in uh, Seaside, California. And so um, I named myself Rita Highland Williams. I don't know. Can, <laughs> can, can you see that? Anyway, so I have my um, like the book said. I have my address my words, pages, and, um, and you can all see that I was a, quite serious about writing because um, I was even editing myself, you know, um, <laughs> trying to make it better. Who knew what editing would ultimately be? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I wrote, um, I wrote every night. I wrote 500 words every night. Wow. Um, wow. And then I got to 1,000 words a night and then 1,500 words a night and so on. Um, I, um, I eventually sold my first story to Highlights Magazine. Highlights is still around. Um, and my story is called Benji Speaks. Well, can you see that? Uh, mm -hmm. anyway. um, uh, Benji Speaks about a little Filipino boy um, who wanted to speak to birds. What do I know about the Philippines? You know, I'm like 14 <laughs> years old. What do I know about the Philippines? Well, I had a friend who um, had come from the Philippines and she told us so many stories. And so um, I would just imagine it. And, um, and, and then that's where the story came from. And so I got my first sale, which was so important to me. That is, um, that's amazing that you were a disciplined writer, uh, a professional writer at age 12 and, and 14. So can you describe actually the writing process itself what you oh. did as a writer when okay, you so get the idea actually, for a story how do you how do you proceed with that okay so actually i i think i write in so many ways the same way i did when i was 8 10 and 12 
um, I, um, I become um, fascinated by an idea, uh, something that just makes me want to know more and more and envision and imagine more. And then from that, I know I have kind of like a proof of story that I can, uh, that I can tell and, and lead it somewhere. Um, then I still handwrite. I'm a handwriter. And so even when I, um, uh, when I was writing One Crazy Summer, uh, this is actually from One Crazy Summer. This is my notebook. I, I wrote on a um, graph uh, pad and I would get up in the morning and I would, um, I would write, I would just handwrite. Um, uh, this is, these are actually um, like first chapters that, that would turn into like actual uh, chapters um, in the book and what have you. Um, and so as I would um, handwrite, um, um, I would do things like um, I'd, I'd gather, um, I'd gather uh, th uh, things that would inspire me um, in doing the research. Uh, yes, there's research, but I also have to have those, those tangible things that really make me feel the subject that I'm writing about. So in the, in, um, uh, for One Crazy Summer, um, I love the, um, the Black Panther art. I, I grew up seeing it. Um, um, by Emery Douglas. So, um, so I made sure I had this with me, and so I could see the um, the kinds of um, the kinds of uh, pictures that that really kind of de depict a movement, a mood, uh, a sentiment, um, and um, and the truth from their point of view. So, having the art was very important to me. I'd listen to music of that period. Um, see, okay, so back when I was listening to it. Um, in the 60s, it was like to dance, right? Okay, yeah. but this is different. You know, you're listening as a as a writer. Um, it was important for me to have the newspapers. So this is a collection of the Black Panther um, intercommunal uh, news. Um, so I get the truth from their point of view. So um, research is not just digging the facts, but you have to dig into the perspective of the subjects that you are studying. And so for me, yes, there was, um, you know, I could, um, you know, PBS, um, um, the Times and the, um, the other newspapers and media sources and, and books out there. But without the kind of um, play by play um, uh, telling, by the Black Panthers themselves, something would be missing. Would so be missing. Primary, primary sources rather than just secondary sources. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So that was very important to me. Um, I write. Um, I, I I I handwrite because I start to feel the rhythm of um, of of their speech. The um, the characters who I'm building their speech. I can feel the rhythm of their speech that way. Um, I do a lot of backstory. I tell, I talk about things that you'll never ever see in the book, but I have to know it. I have to feel where they come from. And that's the reason why there is a sequel and a third book in One Crazy Summer, because the more that I knew about them, the more that I said, oh, 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 okay. Oh, mm, <laughs> this can't go in the book. It goes in the next book. Right. And so, it, you know, so that's how that happened. Um, and um, uh, um, there is a work that I'm uh, finishing up now. Um, it's my first YA in years. Um, I, wow, in like a decade. Um, and um, it is set in uh, the antebellum South. Um, uh, and, um, and so in order to do that work, I had, to, um, I had to learn a lot. I had to learn a lot about um, farming, and um, just how things were done. Um, even if only this much of it goes into the story, I have to understand how things happen. So, mm -hmm. so that's a, a good deal of the process itself. And then there's the writing. That's a whole nother segment, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> your, your first book uh, for young readers was, was called um, Blue Tights. And it was published in 1988, I believe, or 87. Yeah. Can you just talk about the journey to uh, getting that first book published? Okay, you see the smile that I have <laughs> on my face now? You didn't see that smile until 30 years after Blue Tights. I am telling you, back then it was all, you know, it was, um, 
it was the part, I think it was the thing that made me a writer um, because uh, I had to, I had to write and rewrite without, um, with the faith that, that this story was worth telling. Mm -hmm. No matter how many times it was rejected, it was worth telling. Mm -hmm. It was someone's story. It was a story that was not told, and I felt that only I could tell it in the way that I wanted to tell it. And so um, th th these were the typewriter days, the typewriter with the whiteout and the correct, um, you know, and all that stuff. Um, and so um, to, uh, to send that story out and to get it rejected again and again and again, it was, it was really very hard for me to, um, to deal with expectations of publishing you know i was a very young person and um and i had my own way of thinking and and i had my own feelings of why there weren't books that reflected girls that i saw um in my neighborhood um that i grew up with or uh, so forth um and so i felt that we were being excluded so it took a long time for me to kind of calm down and read my work and say, oh, okay, maybe I could make this change. Oh, okay, maybe I won't say that. Oh, <laughs> what does this have to do with the story? It took a long time for me to have some kind of objectivity. Um, so that was about six years. And then um, finally I did, I went back to, I went back to, to the beginning. The marketing, the how to write, how to sell a book, yeah, what I learned when I read 12 years ago. Um, and so I started looking at the books in the library, uh, looking and seeing who's publishing realistic books and who's publishing, at that time, they said ethnic books. We didn't even have multicultural at right. that time. Um, and so I started to narrow that down. And instead of flinging my work out to the world, I, I narrowed it down to um, to about six publishers that said that they wanted realistic work and, um, you know, not just like uh, the cookie cutter stuff. Um, I finally, um, I got a, um, a reply from Rosemary Brosnan at Lodestar Books at um, E.P. Dutton, which is now Penguin. Um, and uh, from there, um, I then learned what editing and writing was really about. <laughs> so, so how did you, um, I mean, it seems that you started doing more research and really learning more about the, the publishing process, right? Uh, rather than uh, being uh, overcome by the rejections. Yeah. But what, what, what kept you motivated to, 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 can, to continue to write? Um, you know, you have to have faith. You, you truly do. You have to have faith um, in your purpose and in what you have to say. Um, and every time I would see something, some evidence of that I was telling the truth out in the world, I would say to myself, you know, um, no, I'm not going to give up. I'm just, I'm just going to try again. I will try again. And it helped me a lot to have some distance from my work because when I was getting rejected, I would just go back and write again and then send it back out. So in essence, I was reading and writing the place where I was. I wasn't seeing something else and I needed to be able to see something else. So writers often need distance from their work just to reset and, and see something that perhaps you didn't see before. And so that's kind of what I needed. Um, I, um, so the rejection started at 22 and um, I believe I sold the story, I was 29, mm -hmm. maybe 29, something like that. Uh, and- um, it was to publish that first book, to get that yeah. book published. Now, were you writing other stories or was this the only story that you were writing at that time? Oh, I was writing, I was writing all kinds of stuff. I wasn't publishing them, but I was writing them. I wrote a lot of short stories uh, for, um, that I was sending to like the New Yorker and, and, and Atlantic and, and um, 
and to Essence and uh, Ebony and everywhere. I would I was always writing something, and that was the thing. It was the writing. The writer's life is writing. You yeah. know, um, you have a job um, and you have responsibilities, but you will always find yourself to the writing. You can't say to yourself, oh, I'll wait when I get a computer. I'll wait when I, you know, this. I'll wait when, no. What is in you has to push you forward each and every day You so that you will steal that time if you have to. And um, often, you know, it's what I had to do, especially in the early parts of writing. Um, I was a, I married, I had two young children. Um, I had a full-time job. Um, I was in graduate school um, and my husband was also in the service and he was in, he was uh, getting his BA degree. And so whenever he deploy and he was enrolled, I would go and take his class for him. Um, and, <laughs> and sometimes write them papers. <laughs> Uh, but, um, you know, by the time he would come back, he could take his midterms and, and what have you. But I had to, I, I was in graduate school also. I had kids I had to take care of. And, you know, and, and, and then I had books under contract during that, those times. So um, I was very, very fortunate. I had a published, I had an editor who was patient with me. She believed in what mm -hmm. I was doing. And so she gave me the time to work. Um, and, um, but, um, through it all, you have to have faith. You must have faith that, um, that someone is waiting for your book and mm -hmm. that someone will understand what it is you're writing. Mm -hmm. Rita, you, you create some wonderful, engaging characters. I mean, Katura loves Fern. <laughs> so, how, what do you get your characters from? What do you, what do you draw from when you are creating uh, those, those wonderful, engaging characters? Okay, so now, um, Katura, cover your ears. You don't want to hear this. <laughs> um, so my characters tend to not be consciously based on any one. Mm -hmm. I will start with the first character, the primary character, and I have an idea of what their journey and their struggle is. So um, to tell their story, they need agents around them, um, agents to activate their superpowers, their, their own character. So if I have um, a character who is very responsible, like Delphine, then she's got to have some miscreants around her, you know, misfits yep. around her, you know, she's, so she's got, so, so that we can see her being responsible. So we can see her losing parts of her childhood to mother her sisters. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so we could see her, um, her triumphs that she is smarter than they are and faster than they are in certain ways. And then we see that, um, that, you know, oh, you know, you wish she could be a little girl, you know, that she could have that moment to just have wonder in her life, like a fern, or to be all about herself, like Bonetta. Um, so, uh, so that's basically the kind of the, the, um, the ingredients for building a character, building those characters is having that, um, that central character, and kind of assessing what is needed for them to move forward in their journey. Um, I just want to say that um, particularly in One Crazy Summer and, and those books, um, it was important for me to have um, kind of counter counterweights. Um, you have the very um, militant um, Black Panther movement. So I had to have Big Ma. Mm -hmm. I had to have the traditionalists. Um, uh, so that you'd have that kind of the argument between back and forth. Um, and then you'd have someone like Pa who is in the middle. So you have someone who, sa um, uh, one says Muhammad Ali, one says Cassius Clay, um, and then someone is in the middle, you mm -hmm. know. Um, so, so, so it's kind of how I use characters. They're like um, the, the, the dialogue is so strong. You, you, yeah, the dialogue yeah. between them, the, the, the speaking, the, the knowledge of the history behind each character really comes out through that dialogue. Well, 
Well, yeah, I, I have my mother and her love of jazz to thank for that. So uh, from the time I was a, you know, just a, a child uh, spending time with my mother alone because um, I, I wasn't sc um, school age yet, um, she had all her friends over at the house. You know, Dizzy would be playing and mm. Hazel Scott and, you know, John Coltrane and, you know, everybody would, would be, um, you know, they'd all be expressing themselves and my mother would be talking back to them. And I would be like, I would be there in the mix, just kind of there, you know. So I grew up with that in my ear, the having, um, having someone speaking and then having someone answering, having someone taking something and then expounding on it. And then, you know, having that kind of dynamic kind of, um, of exchange, give and take and, and fight and, and you, know, you know, all of that and passion um, coming through the music. I had all of that in thank you, mommy, you know, um, um, and so, that, so that's kind of, um, it factors into um, the characters and how they speak and, and how they work together to create that, you know, that one, you know, that one jazz suite, which is the work. Why the 1960s as a, a setting for um, at least two or three of your books? Well, um, I've always wanted to share aspects of my childhood because I think in so many ways I had a happy childhood. And I was um, 11 in 1968. And um, uh, during that period, um, you know, I was, I was very much a child, just as silly as you want to be. Um, and um, um, just all about being a kid. But yet I also... Um, I was also aware of what was going on. You know, my father, I, I watched, I watched the news. Um, I, I, I won't say I read the papers. I looked at the papers. So I saw, you know, um, things that were happening. Um, I, um, I, I just kind of, I, I, I could see what was going on during those times. So I wanted to kind of share that, especially the Black Panther uh, movement, uh, because we don't, get a chance to talk about that part of history. And it was so important in, in the rise of African American um, presence in this, um, in this country um, and in the world. It was so vital, so important. A lot of the, um, a lot of the community um, um, activism uh, that came out of the Black Panther um, movement it, um, is still evident in community services today. So mm -hmm. I had wanted to, I thought it was very important to share that, even though um, some might say uh, the Black Panthers for elementary school, what? Well, they, um, they cater to children, to the very young children uh, and um, uh, young people of all ages mm -hmm. and in very engaging ways. So I thought, well, yeah, this would be wonderful for Delphine to walk into Oakland and have all this Black power all around her and and a interesting mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, can you tell us a little bit? You have actually taught writing. It seems that you have you taught writing or how to be a writer yourself, but you also taught adults in an MFA program at Vermont. Can you share a little bit of advice that you give to your students or gave to your students in that process? Oh yeah, you know there are there are a lot of things that I tell students um, um, over and over and over again. Uh, one of them is um, to uh, as as you are writing to know that whatever it is that you're trying to say, it's usually already there in your story. You see, often we add we tend to add a lot, add this, add that, add this, and then the story gets away from you. But what you really need is already there. So it's, it's so important to know the essence of the story that you are trying to tell and, um, the, soul and uh, the soul of your protagonist um, and, and why and how they are pushing forward or, or what is pushing them backwards and you know, to, to really have a firm grasp on those things. Um, it's so important, like choosing who tells the story is everything. Mm. Who tells that story? Sometimes we, the writer, want um, maybe a lot more kind of control 
as to what is being told. And so um, we can do that very well in third person. But oftentimes, it's the first person narrative. Hmm. that can have an honesty um, in, in kind of directing the story because they should have no other agenda but their own. Right. <laughs> and um, I know I have to stop myself, um, even like with writing from uh, Delphine's um, perspective, I had to stop myself from putting in things that I want in there because they should know this and <laughs> I want it in there and nobody knows this and this is something that's going to be forever lost and I'm putting it in my book. And then I, you know, after like, I calm down um, <laughs> and, and then I go back and read it and I take it out because if I don't take it out, uh, Rosemary will say, Rita. <laughs> It's good to be an editor, but it's good to have an editor. Well, uh, yeah. Well, talk, um, Rita, a little bit more about the importance of having um, a good relationship with an editor. Because uh, I think a lot of times people think, uh, those who are not aware of the industry itself, they think you write a manuscript and it's copy edited and then boom, it's, it's out. Talk about the process of working with the, an editor and how important that is. Okay, so yeah, good. This is, you know, um, understand that I come out of a, of a period of distrust of the white man, yeah. okay? So um, I am not eager to have a white person go over my book and mm -hmm. tell me to take this out and to, um, can you make, and making suggestions to me. So I came into writing with this wall and resistance, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and I had to learn that a lot of suggestions are made, uh, the, for the most part, um, everybody wants your book to succeed. Rita, this isn't a plot from the man everybody wants your book to succeed. And in order for it to succeed, um, you have to sometimes get out of your way, get out of your character's way, get out of your story's way and let it push forward. Let it truly, um, you, know, um, you know, be the story that you intend to tell, even though you didn't know it in the first place. So <laughs> oftentimes that is what an editor does. An mm. editor, um, an editor brings a kind of a perspective that is the champion of the book. They so want that book to succeed. So they will make suggestions. Um, uh, they will definitely let you know when uh, that's the wrong use of that word. Uh, you want to rephrase that or this is unclear. Hello, uh, this is unclear. Rita, can you clarify that? Um, 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 my favorite faux pas are, I tend to, I think because I have rhythm in my head, I tend to repeat words and I'm not um, aware of it. And so sometimes um, I'll be asked, um, is this repetition intended? You know, um, oh, no, it is not. Let me change that. <laughs> um, you know, um, sometimes uh, these days, I think more than ever, we are endeavoring to not offend, to put things in the most, um, in, the, in, in the most, I hate to say correct light, but respectful uh, light. We want to respect people. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, so it's, uh, for me, I, I may get a question about, are you sure you want to use this terminology or, um, uh, be aware of this perspective because it might court whatever. Um, and so these are the decisions that writers must make um, and editors must um, uh, be vocal about what they might face out in the world. Uh, you can't go out into the world. You are the author, the authority. After the book has been edited, you stand out there and you receive whatever it is that you're going to receive about your story. And so, um, uh, so you must, you cannot say, oh, I did not know. 
I've had a student who put something in her book. Um, she was writing outside of her experience. And so she put something in her book and I had to say to her, okay, so this is what this read, this is how this reads to um, the black reader who you are trying to write for, you know? Uh, did you know that you just said this? Did you know that this is an epithet? Did you know that um, that this person might not actually say that? Mm -hmm. And let me explain why. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you know, uh, so like having um, a relationship with uh, with someone who is the champion of your book, the editor is very important. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, there's respect, the respect goes both ways. Mm -hmm. And I had to come a long, long way to get. I mean, how important is it to uh, get the right editor? Uh, Oh, it is, it is everything. It really is because you can have, you know, editors have different philosophies, different styles. Mm -hmm. Publishers have different um, styles of how they go about it, what have you. So um, what happens is basically your agent is the person that really thinks long and hard about what is the best care for your book, the best care and deal and all of that for your book, and who would really care for your book and your work. Um, and so having, um, getting a really good editor has um, a lot to do with getting the right agent. Mm -hmm. you, know? mm -hmm. uh, they, you can still uh, get an agent, even if you are unpublished, you can still get an, get an agent. It's so important also, to join um, um, organizations, um, writers' organizations, and to network. Um, even though we are not physically networking, we're still networking. Um, um, SCBWI, the Society of Children's Book um, Writers and Illustrators, is very, you know, it, it provides so many opportunities um, so that you can um, um, get to know editors and, uh, and, and agents or hear them um, at lectures and what have you, so important. Educate yourself as much as you can about the industry, um, not just what you think it is, like I, uh, uh, the way I, I went about it, but um, you know, uh, go out there and find out because a lot of these, a lot of publishing um, houses, a lot of agents, they are looking for that voice, that unique voice. They are looking for your voice. And, and so sometimes you may need help bringing it out. Mm -hmm. And you know. there are people there that, that, that can do that for you. We've heard that a lot in, yes. in our work, agents and editors and uh, someone who's championing your story. Yes. So can you tell us uh, what you're working on now? <laughs> okay, or, so if you can, if you can. So, um, uh, what am I doing now? Right now I'm, I'm, um, I'm revising, I'm doing like the, um, um, five, um, revisions for my YA adult crossover, um, which is set in the 1860s. Um, and, um, and that has been an education for me. So maybe 2021 that might come out. Um, I have a gaming novel that I wrote first of, oh, about like 10 years ago. Um, same time as uh, One Crazy Summer. And um, it was not ready. I mean, I loved it, you know. <laughs> I sure enough loved it, but <laughs> surely do. <laughs> but uh, oh, you got that right. But mm, <laughs> that thing was rough. So, <laughs> so it, takes a while, it takes a while to write a, a book and to get it ready for the, the for the book to tell you that it's ready to be published. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. So. <laughs> But we um, about at the end of the interview, and you've shared some really great information. Um, my last question for you before we get to the lightning round is um, what uh, is the most rewarding thing uh, about being a published author? You won a whole lot of awards and gotten recognition. Uh, and I'm sure all those things are important. But what, what is the most rewarding part of it for you? I don't think about 
what I'm going to eat. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> I am serious. I hear you. <laughs> it is a joy to just say, I want, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and I can go and get it, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, to open up my refrigerator and there's food, you know, mm -hmm. um, a, a, a variety of things to eat um, and, and healthy things, you know. Um, um, and um, I, it, it's, it's, it's that, it, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's that I can take care of myself. That, that is, that's number one. Mm -hmm. um, but there is something about seeing someone reading my book quietly, you know, and I go, I will not disturb them because they are already paying me back. Right. You know, I'm already getting paid here. You know, just seeing that, you know, that that's so important to me. Um, that's a good answer. Good, good answer. Like well. well, we come to uh, the uh, quick part of the, oh, no. yes. <laughs> the lightning round. So we're going to ask you a couple of, of questions and, and just give us the, the best and the, the quickest answer that, uh, that you can. Okay. Okay. All right. So what is um, the favorite book that you have created? One Crazy Summer. And who is your favorite character that you've created? Fern? <laughs> Gatura raised her hand. <laughs> That's difficult, right? That is so hard. It's a. I, don't answer then. Don't answer. You know, we, 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 we don't want the characters to get angry at you. <laughs> <laughs> who, who then has um, um, influenced you most as a writer? My mother. What is your favorite food or dish? Catfish. Oh, mine too. <laughs> Fried catfish. Fried catfish from, from New Orleans. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So can you describe a, a favorite night out? What would, would be that for you, for Rita? Okay. A favorite night out is exactly what we did on our uh, first wedding anniversary, Fred and I. Um, 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 we, we went out to dinner. And then we went to, um, and then we went to a boxing match, and um, and I got to see uh, one of my friends uh, defend her title, um, and and so that, yeah. That's right because you, uh, right, you, you once you box, uh, I, you work at it. Uh, I um I I I used to train. Um, I used to train. Um, until I had this like um, deadline uh, to meet for my story, and I had to like sit down and do nothing else but that. But but yeah, I love I've loved boxing since I was a little girl. My father trained under Angelo Dundee, who was Muhammad Ali's trainer. Oh wow! Yeah, that's an, that's another book. Oh that's wow! Another yeah. book. <laughs> when you're not writing or speaking to students, um, how are you most likely to spend your time? Um. <laughs> I, have, I, have, I, have a, I have a punching bag. Right, I have a punching bag right here. I, I I love to box. Good, that's wonderful. I do. Okay, so we're about at the end of this wonderful interview, and we want to thank you, Rita. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us and to share your experiences uh, as a writer. We want to also thank um, the viewers for tuning in, and uh, we ask that they join us next time for another segment of Just Us And, where we will talk with those who create the books that we read, as well as those who get the books into the hands of the readers. Remember, good books make a difference. Thank you, Rita. Bye, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye.